Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It is good to be with you all here and it's kind of nice to have a little bit of sunshine and, and it's, it's actually disappearing rather quickly, but uh, we'll enjoy it while we can. Thank you for coming to worship today and uh, we pray whether we are worshiping together in person or whether we're worshiping from our homes for safety, for grace, for peace, for all of our hearts and our souls and our bodies. I just have three short announcements. One is that we pulled off a successful annual meeting for the first time ever. It was a hybrid of in-person and Zoom. We had about an equal number of, of people here in person as well as on Zoom. And I think the spirit of the meeting was, was joyful. Looking back on the year and just seeing how God has provided and how we as a congregation have been able to adapt and, and come up with creative ways of continuing to minister to each other and continuing to be the church. I think it was, a, it was one of the funnest congregational meetings I've ever been a part of. Um, also want to let you know, today something new starts. At 9.30, there's going to be a virtual meet and greet, and hopefully everybody got that in an email, but you can click on that and it will be a, a Zoom meeting where you can just visit and at least lay eyes on people that you may not have seen for a, for a while, and especially for those who are worshiping at home, it's a chance to connect with all of you. So after this service, I guess it depends on how long Pastor Jody preaches. Um, you, can, you can zip home, and, or well, you can visit here for a few minutes, and then you can zip home and visit online for an hour and a half, so from 9.30 to 11 o'clock today. And the last thing, just a little heads up, you know, Wednesday the 17th of this month is Ash Wednesday, and uh, we're putting together a very special service. Again, it will be hybrid. It will be, a, you know, people will be welcome to worship here as well as online, and, and uh, we're even figuring out a way to have ashes at home. All right. Oh. Wanted to invite you to a concert that I'm going to be uh, performing um, next Saturday night, 7.30 p.m., uh, here from the sanctuary. I mean, it's going to be broadcast uh, out over the Internet, but it's a vocal recital featuring some of my own music and uh, another guy by the name of Franz Schubert. You might have heard of him before, but anyway... You're welcome to come. I'm going to get a, a Zoom link, and, and it'll be uh, distributed to, to you. So if you do Zoom meetings, uh, just consider this a fun one for music. So thank you. So it's next Saturday night. Okay, we'll begin our worship with the order of confession and forgiveness. Would you please stand? Let us confess together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Let's join in singing together, O Day of Rest and Gladness.
please be seated as we have our reading from Isaiah. Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and who spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right hand disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our gospel today comes from the gospel of Mark, the first chapter. Will you please stand? As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told her about him at once. They told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick and with various demons and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a desert place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. They say that a good sermon has an incredible beginning and a strong ending, and a great sermon puts those two as close together as possible. For Pastor Tom's comment. Grace to and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When you think about your life, how do you see God? Think about that for a minute. When you think about your life, how do you understand God in it? Is God active and involved? Or is God removed and distant? Have you ever thought about it? It's a good question for us to ponder today because these two texts, that from Isaiah and from Mark, are meant to have us think about who God is in our struggles, how God cares for our afflictions, and knows the hardships of this world. This is key when we think about how we build a relationship with God, is it not? How do you follow a God who does not care about you? How do you love a God who you believe is so far from your suffering? See, it's important to think about how we see God because in how we see God, there is exactly where our relationship with God is built. As we ponder this question, we have this incredible call from God through the prophet Isaiah. 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? How do you love that passage, right? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Jesus once said, are you still so dull? Is it hard for us to imagine a God who walks with his people? I love this passage from Isaiah. It's one of my favorites. I I did a video devotional this week on it. It's a passage that was read at my confirmation and ordination. It's one that I think has a great power for us as we live a life of faith. This conversation between the prophet Isaiah and God for the sake of God's people. God will not allow his people to believe that he exists as some great deity far above the realms of the earth. He does not exist simply in the dome of the earth, but instead walks with his people, cares for his people, loves his people, in fact, loves them so much that he sent his one and only son, that all who would believe in him would but not perish but have eternal life in him. This is a God who does not grow weary. This is a God who never loses his strength or power despite what we face in this world. Now you and I, we grow weary, don't we? I mean, aren't we weary from life, especially in the times in which we live? I sometimes wonder how much more weary can we grow? I mean, here we are, it's February. We're approaching a year of COVID in our society. A year of restrictions, a year of limitations. I visit people who haven't had a hug for almost a year. Can you believe it? Maybe you're one of them. How much longer until this world makes sense again? How much longer until the civil unrest of this country is once again put down? Once again, we find a sense of unity. How much longer until the negativity subsides and it's no longer all-consuming in virtually every facet of life? How much longer until we celebrate once again prosperity and unity and goodwill? How much longer until we are healed as a people and as a nation? Because when I look at this world, that's my biggest problem. It's my biggest struggle with it. Things don't make sense. And I long for things to make sense once again. Don't you? It's hard not to be suspicious. It's hard not to be cynical. And someone once very faithful told me cynicism isn't part of faith. And yet, God knows all of that, doesn't he? God knows us. The one who formed us in our mother's womb, the one who knows us so well, he knows our cares, he knows our concerns, he knows our worries and our fears. God knows that we are ill. He knows it. He knows that we are afflicted with so many things as a people, as a nation, as a society, and as a world. God knows all of this and yet loves us. Sometimes despite us, God loves us and promises us to heal us and restore us. From Isaiah to Mark, that is the good news of the gospel for us today. So we turn to Mark. And once again, Jesus is teaching with his disciples. And as the day grows long, they go to find rest. I love the rhythm of Jesus' ministry because as the day grows long, he always goes away to rest and renew. And so they go to the house of Peter. Isn't it a houseful? They go into this house, right? And this is a multi-generational house. This is a home where the mother-in-law and the wife and the kids, and they're all in it together. This is part of a society before there were nursing homes and assisted living where every generation crammed under the same house. 
They were sharing life together. Our introduction into the life of our disciples comes with Peter. Peter's mother-in-law, the, wife of his, uh, the mother of his wife, is ill with a fever. Now, as we read this text, we have no idea if this is an occasional fever, if this was something that was an ongoing occurrence or a lifetime affliction. We have no idea how often this occurred in her life where she had to subside and go and rest because of the fever. Yet what we do read in this text is that she is restricted. She has to go and rest because in ancient times, a fever was dangerous. You had no idea what was happening within your body, and so she went to rest. Upon entering the house, Jesus and these new disciples, friends, they're sharing the news of this woman because they know this Jesus can make a difference for her. In the translation we read, it, it kind of glosses over a word that is predominant in the Gospel of Mark immediately. I love the Gospel of Mark because Mark is in a hurry to bring us to faith. Immediately, Jesus entered the home. Immediately, they told Jesus about Peter's mother-in-law. Immediately, he went to her and he held her. Jesus touches her immediately, and there is no holding back. There is no time to waste. He touches her and she is healed. The miracle of touch. We see two miracles throughout the Gospels. There's the miracle of touch and the miracle of the word. And in this moment, Jesus grabs her and lifts her up. He takes her and restores her to her position and status of life. And how she, does she respond? We read it. It would seem almost immediately she gets up and she begins to serve. This woman has been freed from her afflictions. She has been set free for the one thing that she was created to do, and nothing was going to hold her back from doing it. Immediately, she is healed, and she is restored. She's not held captive by a fever. She's well restored to a well-lived life, and it's all because Jesus has set her free. Now, during the week, as it is, I like to listen to a Lutheran theologian, Jim Nestigan. He's a great Lutheran theologian. He actually lives not far from here. Jim is brilliant. He's a good old Lutheran from North Dakota. So you get that good Norwegian. You know that accent some of you make fun of me still for? So Jim is doing his exegesis on the text, and, and he starts to chuckle. Jim's a big guy. He starts to chuckle. And you get that big belly laugh, as only good old Norwegians can do. And he says, some of you preachers, you better watch out. Be careful. Some of you are going to get yourself into trouble. He says, as I, as I talk about this text, I have to be mindful that my wife is standing over my shoulder. Just because this is a woman who is restored does not mean she goes to womanly duties. She is restored for her purpose. Her vocation. That's what we read in the text. It might be tempting to just equate this as a woman being restored and going back to some subservient behavior because of her gender. But no, she's restored to the vocation for which she was called into. And that's important. When Jesus heals you and restores you, he does so for a purpose. To return you to the vocation God has called you into. Now as we continue to read this passage, we know that this is not only for Peter's mother-in-law. It's also for everyone. Word has gotten out that Jesus is a healer. We read in our text that many came, they filled the doorways, they stood outside into the evening and late into the night. Get up, take your mat, be healed, casting out demons. And they left praising God. These people who had been removed from their communities because their affliction were now healed and restored to be part of a society that they were called in to live. And that's where the rejoicing came. Once again, they were able to gather together. 
to be the society that God was calling them to be. Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law and then sets loose this flood of grace on everyone who would come and gather to the neighbors and the surrounding areas. And notice the only people who are silenced, and it's not the people, right? The only being that is silenced are the demons, are the ones who know who Jesus really is. Everyone else is left to praise him for what they are experiencing in him. All day and into the night we read, Jesus' work is done. And as the morning breaks, Jesus retreats. He goes off to rest and to pray. Reminiscent of Isaiah, notice Jesus does this by himself. He goes off to wait on the Lord. He returns to be with the one who formed him, who knit him together in his mother's womb. The Son of God, now fully man, is weary, and he goes off to be rested and renewed so he can continue the work of restoration. Jesus goes off to wait on the Lord and be renewed in strength so he can mount up like that of an eagle with wings. After some time, the disciples come, and Jesus says, I'm ready. Don't you love that? What a great example. God's own son goes off to rest and renew and be ready for what God has called him to do. He says, this is what I came into the world for. And if God's own son does this, should we not also do the same? Are any of us greater than God's own son? That we don't have to rest and renew so we can follow the work God has called us to do? As we listen to this word, I want you to think about that question that I asked at the beginning. What about your life? Where in your life do you see God at work? The span between Isaiah and Mark is centuries. And yet the message is the same. God will sustain you. God will heal you and restore you to the vocation God has called you to do. No matter what that looks like. When Christ is at the center of your life, everything else flows through him. Now, this text is always hard to hear when you are one with an affliction, aren't you? I mean, when you hear this text, don't you want Jesus to physically grab your hand and lift you up as well? If you are afflicted with disease, if you've been struggling with treatments, don't you want this physical presence of Jesus to grab your hand and lift you up? But hear this. God's Holy Spirit is at work in each of us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is at work in each of us, restoring us, healing us in a way that we might not want, but that we desperately need. So we can be restored to serve him in all that we do. This is the good news. And we gather here today because the masses continued to share that good news. Because through the generations, the centuries, people continue to see God at work being healed and restored and called and sent. And so if it was true for all of them before, it is as true for us today. Come, rest, renew. Be given God's word and his Holy Spirit so you can be restored, healed, restored, and set free. All it takes is faith. All it takes is faith to know and believe it to be true. And for that we say thanks be to God. Amen.
Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we gather in your name and we gather at your great invitation that gather us, us from all walks of life, the healthy and the sick, those who have been walking in your grace and walking in your ways and those who have been stumbling into sin, Lord. We thank you that you welcome all of us with the same love and the same grace. And we pray for each other today, for those of us who come weary in body and mind and in spirit. Lord, we thank you for the reassurance of your promises and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit in our hearts to revive us and to renew us from the inside out. And we thank you, Lord, that with the power of your Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible. So encourage us, give us hope, give us joy, give us peace, give us love for you and for each other, Lord. For we know that in doing so, our lives are changed and this world is changed around us. Lord, in your mercy, Father in heaven, what a privilege it is that we can come to you with our hurts, with our fears and our worries, and especially as we carry in our hearts the, the love and the concern that we have for loved ones who are sick and in need of your healing touch and your protection. Father, we pray for John and Linda Ritter's daughter, Alex, as she recovers from kidney transplant. We pray for Diane Hawkins' sister, Linda, for Norris Shippen, for Roger Magnuson, for Nancy Arneson, for Barb Sandberg, for William Paul, for Mike Haley, for Tom and Francis Oline's granddaughter, Lizzie, for Betty Raymond's son, Bill, and his wife, Mary Ellen, for Fred Barnes, Adam Wotorek, for Sally and Phil Nygaard's son-in-law, Emmanuel, for Sandy Axon's sister, Jackie, for Lori Andreas, for Trina Arneson, for Jim Moen, for Sharon Geyer's daughter, Wendy, for Carl Hedin, for Dennis Pofall, and Father, we thank you that for those we've named before you, you have heard these prayers. We pray now that you would hear the prayers that we each bring to you from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, For this troubled world, Lord, for a, the weariness of, that so many carry, for the fears and the worries that we carry into this new year, Father, you alone can give restoration. You alone can bring true healing and true reconciliation, true hope. And so we lift ourselves, we lift our community, we lift our state, our nation, and our world to you asking that your spirit would turn the hearts of all people to seek you, to humble ourselves before you, and to allow our hearts to be instructed again by your word. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, I invite you to get the bread and the wine that you received on your way into church. And if by chance you didn't receive it on the way in the church, um, uh, raise your hand and we'll get it to you, okay? On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And after the supper, Jesus took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, Take this and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we pray together as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Please join in singing our sending hymn. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now go in peace. Serve the Lord. Please remember to exit out these doors over here. Thank you.